Hey there YouTube, Travis here, and we're back with our friend, the Pook ZA50, and it's a little bit more assembled than it was before. So if you remember from the last video, this is totally my first time rebuilding a ZA50. Um, I'm learning a lot of stuff here for the first time, and I didn't want to make a full step-by-step -step video, maybe someday. Um, I was following David Fixes His Stuff. Uh, his video was great in terms of reassembling all the transmission bits. Um, the uh, plastic, I think it looks like, kind of like a star gear, um, that actually gave me the most trouble getting that to, to go in, but eventually I, I got it. Um, and then I have the cable adjuster up here screwed all the way in. I hope that's a good place to get started. Uh, we'll find out in a little bit as we move through the process. And then just some very miscellaneous uh, transmission things to mention. I did flip the second gear clutch. Uh, that's popular on a ZA50 where you put some performance parts on it. Uh, to give you a more delayed shift in the second gear. Um, there is also, as mentioned, the end transmission shimming. Um, I actually just popped this cover on here temporarily. I'm going to go ahead and, and do that today as well. Now, if you remember from the last video, uh, one of the things I was debating on was whether to put this motor on the original frame that it came with, uh, the green Pook Maxi, um, or to do something a little bit more fun like the rigid free spirit. Well, ultimately, um, we're keeping the rigid free spirit more simple. Uh, it has an E50 on it, um, and this is slowly getting pieced together whenever I have spare time and some spare parts to throw at it. Uh, but you might have a clue. It's the frame on the green bike that is actually taking the longest. So yes, that is a jug of a vapor rust. Uh, this stuff is a miracle worker. Um, I've done plenty of videos on tank coatings and, and things like that but I'm always a fan of using the least abrasive method you need um, if you can get away with it. So we used a vapor rust on the maxi tank uh, a couple of weekends ago, had a grand old time, classic backyard pressure washer, a vapor rust, uh, and then making a really um, oil rich two stroke mix to brim the tank with to prevent flash rust. And here it sits today, uh, ready for the ZA50 to go back on it. Um, still full of that very oil rich premix. Um, that pet cock is probably about 10 years old, but that's holding it back great. No leaks um, in the Amazon bicycle stand was the perfect thing we needed for this. So yes, all the typical fun things uh, with the maxi frame, spending an entire day cleaning the tank. Uh, however, I wanted to also talk a little bit about the rear wheel uh, that came with this bike. Um, someone put probably again about 10 years ago, judging by the receipt uh, that I got with it. Uh, these these uh, modern tires, these are D-Stone World Travelers, um, they're fine. Um, there's not any cracking or, or anything on them yet, so I'm not super worried. Um, I was just gonna go ahead and run this, but uh, took the back wheel off and, and gave it another quick inspection, and I'm really glad that I didn't run this rim uh, with a kitted fast bike. Here's why. Okay, with all the hardware off, the brake plate comes off, and take a look at this. Um, so again, uh, you can see all the grease has been thrown out from the wheel bearings. This actually has a ton of play. Um, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, so, you know, again, when you're doing a nice build, it's really easy to overlook the small stuff, um, but that could actually be really dangerous later on. So. Uh, this is going to get full service, um, rear wheel bearing grease repacking, uh, and then we should be in much better shape. Uh, the brakes are actually pretty decent. There's a fair amount of meat left on them. Um, I'm just going to clean up the surfaces and, and we're going to run it for now. Uh, but there's one other thing I want to talk about when it comes to the wheels, and that's the gearing. So factory gearing on a ZA50 is 18 in the front, 40 in the back. Um, which is perfectly fine for stock applications, uh, but once you kit and go faster, um, when you get into the higher speeds, you'll be running really high RPMs. Uh, and people that run untouched bottom ends that haven't been rebuilt, that still have a nice brass bushing crank, I use nice uh, sarcastically there, um, they really have to think about this. And I'll also say that for wanting to do a low maintenance, not trying to break any speed records build, um, not trying to go you know, run my stuff super hard. It's something I thought about also. Um, so we went from uh, 18 to 40, down to 19 and 37. Um, the front gets a little bit bigger. 
and they actually do sell 20, 21, and I think even 22 uh, teeth in the front. Um, I know someone who's running a 21. You do have to grind the case. Um, I'm not trying to get into it that deep, so I think I should be okay with 19 in the front. And when you have snowflake rims, you're a little limited uh, with the sprocket selection. Um, so this was the one that was uh, the smallest that, that I could find easily. Uh, if you have the spoke wheels, um, you have some more options. And just to talk numbers, if I kept this gearing factory um, at 45 miles an hour, we'd be spinning over 10,000 RPM. Uh, if I was going 50 miles an hour, we're over 11,000 RPM. Um, with the new gearing, we'll be much safer. Um, we'll be at about 8,800 RPM at 45 miles an hour, uh, and then 9,800 at 50. So we'll throw these on as well uh, when we do the wheel service. Um, if you want to check, there's, of course, the Google Docs that have all of the tables built out for your gearing. But honestly, I keep talking about it. I've been talking about it for almost 10 years now. The Moped Gearing Calculator on Marty's Garage um, is, is, is really one of the most useful tools you'll find. Um, so I'll link that in the video description too. All right, last thing on the wheels. Of course, when I went to go tighten the uh, lock nuts on the cone nut, um, it really became obvious that uh, this axle is bent just enough where I can't ever actually get it tight enough where it won't bind. So uh, Snowflakes, uh, they have this lovely 11 millimeter rear axle. Uh, it's something I don't love. And so because this bike has a long seat, um, might have some extra weight on it anyway, uh, we're gonna take this opportunity to upgrade to a 12 millimeter rear axle like the Pook spoke wheels have. Um, so obviously uh, there has to be some hardware changes. I'm going to drill out the brake plate. Um, I'm gonna start with a 7 16 drill bit and we'll go up as much as we need to. Um, the brake plate gets drilled out, and funny enough, actually, a lot of the spacers, the things that aren't threaded on the 11 millimeter axle, um, actually go on pretty easy. So thankfully, the lollipops on the end, uh, and then the little spacer in front of the brake plate, those actually slide on there. So they've got wiggle room here with the 11, but uh, they'll slide on nice for the 12. Uh, in my opinion, should have should have been this way to start, but that's all right. So. We'll go get this tuned up and then we can finally get this wheel put back together and put on the bike and be ready to go. And now, as promised, we'll take a look at shimming the clutch drum and the main shaft. So this is the very last shimming we need to do before we can put the clutch cover on and call it done. So a buddy showed me how to do this. It's pretty easy. Um, let's just keep in mind here that the smaller bearing here corresponds to the main shaft. The larger bearing here corresponds to the clutch drum, which is actually the very end of the crankshaft. The shimming procedure is identical for both. So we'll take the larger of our two uh, shimming tools, go ahead and loosen it up, make sure that the fingers point upwards, and we're gonna put this on the inner diameter of the bearing. So we're gonna go ahead and have this sit on top of a new gasket, and this one's just been put on there. It hasn't been torqued down or anything, so I think I'm okay. So go ahead, get this pressed down, inner diameter of the bearing on the gasket, and then I press down and I tighten the tool. Now I invert, and again, this is going to the main shaft. So we simply invert, place it over top of the main shaft, walk around to the other side of the camera here and if we have this correct what we'll have is one when we push down we won't have any wobble and then when we look uh, right through we won't see any gap so it'll be resting on top of the shims and then there won't be any wobbling like it's too tall just for fun i'll put whoops i'll put another shim on top of here to demonstrate what it's like if it's too tall so obviously that's way too tall um, and we've got some wobble there. So you don't want that. Now I'll just say it was totally worth doing this with the factory shimming. There was one shim in here that was a little too thick. So I had to swap it out for a thinner one from Treats. Um, and then on this one, uh, I had to also swap out for a shim 
but unfortunately, the ones that I bought on treats for the clutch drum, well, they didn't fit. <laughs> but a buddy of mine, the one who was helping me out, uh, he had, this might be an E50 clutch shim. I'm not certain, but it fits great and it gets us exactly where we want. And then of course, for the clutch drum, uh, the, the idea is the exact same. So we go ahead and invert, put us over the, the larger bearing, whoops. Press down, lock it in, invert, come over here, press down again, no wobble and no gap in between the top of the tool and the shims. And now we're ready to reassemble. Okay, so we got all of the clutch cover bolts torqued down to six foot-pounds. Now we can work on the ignition and the top end. So now moving on to ignition. Um, I am gonna be running stock points with this. Again, we're not trying to break any land speed records here. So some robust ignition points are gonna be okay. We're actually gonna reuse the factory Bosch stator uh, that came with this. Some upgrades I'll be making. Um, I want this to perform really well, so I got my hands on a set of new old stock Bosch ignition points. Uh, these ones have a sax part number that was taped to them, but it'll be perfectly fine for this ZA50 stator. Um, the really unique part is actually going to be the ZA50 flywheel, which spins in a different direction than an E50 flywheel. So I've got like a bin full of those, but only one of these. So um, I cleaned up this flywheel. It had some surface rust on the inside. So I just hit that with some very light sandpaper. There's a little bit of pitting, but I think it's gonna be just fine. The magnets are all intact. Um, the stator itself does have a modern uh, connector on the end here. So someone has been in here at, at some point, um, but uh, we'll get those new points put on there. Um, I haven't decided if I'm gonna slap them in and write the second or if we're gonna get it mounted first, um, but uh, we got some nice upgrades coming on there. The Crankshaft for this performance crank, I've left the flywheel key sticking out of here if it'll focus. Um, unfortunately, it seems like it's a little too wide uh, to get in there properly. So I'm okay giving some light taps with a rubber mallet to get the flywheel key in. However, um, gosh, I don't wanna risk uh, shattering the key or damaging it. So I'm gonna lightly sand it um, with some sandpaper, maybe a file. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and see if we can get this in there a little better. Okay, and now we can finally do some top end assembly. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and check the ring gap on this. I actually already did this. Don't be afraid of this. Remember, you wanna pull the rings laterally apart and lift up. Uh, whenever you try and, and kind of twist them, that's when you'll break piston rings. Uh, but this is a really good practice, and in my case, I did have to shave off a little bit of the edge of this with a file, just a tiny bit, uh, in order for it to get an appropriate ring gap that wasn't too narrow. Um, so it all checked out, no big deal. Um, but uh, it's really important uh, that you do this, otherwise you could end up uh, you know, breaking the piston rings because they have no more to expand because they're so tight. Um, anyway, let's move on. All right, so forgive me, moped gods, for I have sinned. You almost always put oil on your gaskets as you assemble. Because I can feel a little ridge for these cases that come together vertically, I don't love that. I'm gonna put just a touch of moto seal on both sides of the base gasket so that it seals. Uh, it's kind of the opposite here, but I really don't want an air leak. So we'll get the ring lined up with the pin. Now, normally there's an arrow that points towards the exhaust. This has an A on it, which is actually not an, an arrow, as you might think it is initially. Um, it matters in terms of A, B, C, D, the actual size of the piston. Uh, there's a few Puccolini piston sizes. So what we'll go by here is the port window right here. Uh, this faces up towards the intake where our wires are coming out for our ignition and not to the drain bolt. 
All right, now for everyone's favorite, the wrist pin clips. Okay, so we'll really oil up the piston. We'll really oil up the cylinder too. All right, exhaust is that way this time. Our reeds in the top of our ignition are right here. Ah, look at that, that's exciting. So we'll get the head gasket next, but before we do, I just wanted to point out what's funny is I misplaced the head gasket that came with the kit, but Polini comes with genuine spares. So we have another head gasket to play with here. Just another kind of nice thing that comes with buying a all-in-one kit like this. So one more thing here. Um, I believe that this is actually, so this is a decomp hole right here. Um, pretty much no US-based pook came with a decomp as part of the head, um, but the kit has a hole here for it. Um, so what I had a buddy of mine do is he tapped and then put in a set screw. I believe this is an M4, um, just to eliminate the possibility of an air leak from there. It's a really nice thing to do, especially if you make a big investment in a kit like a Polini. Like it was meant to be there. Now we use the coupler nut. The old Loctite plus double nut trick for the exhaust. So these are the dreaded uh, read intake bolts, uh, where supposedly if you over tighten these, you will tweak the cylinder ever so slightly, get it out of round and you will seize. So I'll be careful with these, um, but feeling pretty good about it. Famous last words, right? All right. And with that, what we have here is a fully rebuilt ZA50. I am really excited about this. Um, it turns over great. Um, I'm very excited to run this. Uh, there's still loads left to do. Um, we got to install and jet the carb, figure out the starter uh, cable situation, um, go over the timing, um, connect all the bits and bobs, uh, check out that frame and make sure there's not any overlooked safety stuff uh, when it comes to that since I don't know the history of it, um, but we're getting really close. Okay there YouTube. Well, again, first time doing a ZA50 full rebuild. Hope you enjoyed the ride. Not a formal how-to, but maybe if you've been toying with the idea of redoing one of these, it might give you the idea of some of the magnitude. Okay there, YouTube. Until next time.